right, thank you very much everybody for joining us. This is gonna be an amazing panel. We have four really, really smart people uh, and one guy that talks a lot. So I wanna just first of all, thank you guys for, for joining because you know I've had uh, individual meetings with, with each of these gentlemen and the stuff they're doing is literally setting the trend for our entire industry because they're not just making uh, you know solutions and trying to find a problem. They're actually creating solutions that drive the needle forward. And this is why I'm really excited today. So, you know, let's get started. We'll just get each of you to introduce yourselves and, uh, and really kind of talk about what you are, you know, what your role is, what you're doing, and then we'll dive into, you know, the use cases that you've been building because they're really spectacular. So, Mohammed, we'll start with you. Great. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Mo Rajani. I'm the Director of New Business Development uh, with uh, Macy's. Uh, our team focuses on uh, ensuring Macy's continues to be relevant for the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years and beyond. And part of what we do is explore new business models, new concepts, new partnerships, uh, emerging technologies, and figuring out you know, how do we root it within our strategic priorities for the company. And that's where the way we view innovation is um, it, it's not something that you can do on the side, and it's the cool factor around it, but how do you take your your core businesses and layer in whether it's an emerging technology or a new business model to drive the and really move the needle for the company. Um, and as part of that, you know, the, the, the context of how we got into uh, XR or VR, AR uh, was around that. We had a furniture business that is, you know, a, a, a strategic destination business for us where we're known for it. Typically these destination businesses, are we, either we have a number one and number two market share it's top of mind for the customer when they think about the Macy's brand. Um, and as we were looking at the furniture business, clearly I'm, I'm sure everyone here has at some point gone through those, um, you know, the, the, the friction with that process of buying furniture. Um, and you know, it was the right mix of having a, a strategic business that we want to fortify and grow and an emerging technology that had a practical application to solving some of those problems. So excited to share a little bit more about what we, uh, what we saw there. I'm Jason Yim. Uh, I uh, am the CEO of Trigger. We've been doing AR for 10 years now. Uh, we have 150,000 hours of uh, AR, de well, XR development uh, in our history. Um, and we cover things. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Did you just say 150,000 hours? 150,000 hours. So mastery is 10,000 hours. You've got 15 times that. <laughs> yes. Crazy. Not all of them survived, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we can still count their hours, yeah. No, but. Um, uh, and we are currently we're doing um, AR activations for the next Spider-Man, Toy Story 4, the next Star Wars, uh, PGA Tour, NHL, um, NBA, uh, and then all the way to enterprise stuff for uh, Honda uh, of America. But I think in, in all our experience, like the, the main thing that I think that's interesting now is like it does seem that even though it's still early that the market is kind of maturing a little bit so we have kind of distinct business lines with kind of social and web AR on, on one side that's kind of uh, more for uh, quick marketing sort of hits to much more in-depth uh, enterprise tools like using AR for uh, for design or something like that which are much longer processes and and product development and stuff so it's interesting to see that spectrum kind of uh, evolve over time Awesome, and Richard. So my name is Richard Hess. Um, I'm the most of experiences lead uh, in Nestle. I'm based out of uh, Barcelona. In Barcelona, we have a global digital hub, Nestle. That really started a couple years ago, more focused um, holistically on digital marketing technology. So think like your web CMSs, campaign management tools, social media. Um, but a couple years ago, we decided to open uh, more of an innovation arm that's focused on emerging technologies. Um, this team being um, our new generation technologies team. So really our focus is working with different innovation teams in Nestle uh, located in places like San Francisco and Switzerland and Singapore um, to work with them on different pilots and test and learns and concepts. Um, and once we've uh, proved something is successful or have an opportunity that we think we can scale, uh, we bring it to Barcelona and then help industrialize those emerging technologies that all of our um, brands and markets can use. So Nestle is a you know, really big food company. We're in over 170 countries, uh, 2,000 brands. 
So what we're trying to do is industrialize these type of technologies uh, so all of our brands and markets can use it. Uh, and then traditionally we were more focused on um, experiences for consumers, but pretty recently we've expanded that holistically to enterprise use cases as well to help in things like factories and supply chain, warehouses, uh, HR for training, et cetera. So yeah, that's what we do. Amazing. Hey, I'm uh, Eden Chen at Fisherman Labs. Uh, we kind of are very similar to uh, Trigger. Our, uh, we're, we're about 50% on the product side, so building out like kind of platformized products. We just launched uh, Dropout uh, with College Humor, um, the new V on demand platform. Um, working on with other entertainment studios on other uh, video on demand platforms, and then half of our our business is more uh, marketing oriented, kind of like what we mentioned with like a, just like a lot of um, AR activations that are that are being put out. We're probably putting out uh, two to three a week right now, um, and uh, we work with um, almost every consumer and entertainment brand, so Nike, Puma, Wendy's, Carl's Jr. Uh, Sony, Paramount, Disney, um, all, right, that's all those guys. So. <laughs> we get it. You do lots of cool stuff. Yeah. Now let's talk about me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So how many people here have Snapchat? How many people use it daily? Show of hands? Nobody. Literally. I don't think anybody. Anybody use it daily? Okay, Snapchat is by far and away the largest platform for AR in the world. By far. By far. They did a trillion snaps last year, so if you're not on Snapchat, you should start looking at it. They are literally leading the way. And Eden and his team have created some incredible uh, stuff on Snapchat. And one of them, uh, maybe you guys saw that on, on either you know, YouTube or LinkedIn. It was LeBron James coming out of a poster as a Snapchat filter and slamming an AR. That was these guys. And that thing went viral. On my LinkedIn alone, it got 400,000 views just on my personal LinkedIn. So I don't know, how many views did it get total? Yeah, I mean, so it's it's more of an art than a science to calculate it. We we looked at it uh, at least fifty million in the first two days. Um, we've seen like more than a hundred million since then. Overall, hundred million um, impressions that this this thing made, and you know, you guys didn't plan for it. No, I mean, we actually didn't even we didn't share it at all. We didn't even know we'd get any views until um, somebody at another agency uh, who works with Nike uh, went to the store at Foot Locker, shared it, and then someone retweeted it, and. Like Bleacher Report caught on, LeBron James tweeted it, and the yeah, you know when LeBron does something, you know tweets your, right. you're gonna get some traction. So yeah. tell us about, you know, what was kind of the, uh, the precipitating factor of the building that first of all. You, well, you know, obviously it wasn't meant for virality; it was just meant for you know a, a one-off. And yeah, what did that look like? And then you know, what were the, the unexpected consequences of that? Yeah, so I mean, we we've done a lot of different engagements with Nike over over the um, years. We're we're I think we're on four or five different projects with them right now, um, and and you kind of never really know what's going to happen. Obviously, distribution is a huge problem in AR right now, um, and uh, and and hopefully there's a lot of solutions that we're seeing that are um, kind of breaking a lot of the barriers for that. But um, Snap had just launched a uh, target tracking ability, so the ability for us to not just unlock an uh, AR experience, but actually um, have that experience be tracked to where that QR code is unlocking. So you can have you know, a, a mural piece and then have, again, like LeBron coming out of that mural. So we, we wanted to do something that leveraged that, um, and we, we were working with Nike on, on you know, different concepts. You know, we thought something with LeBron would be interesting just because we're in LA and you know, he came to the Lakers. And I mean, that's, this is before the, the, the crazy drama with the Lakers, but um, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was something that was very uh, top of mind at the time and uh, it just kind of a great brand. And so um, uh, we, we kind of work with them on figuring out what, what concept made the most sense for a target tracking use case. And then again, like we never know how people are going to respond to things, um, so we kind of put it out there. We actually had no real marketing strategy. We were in process of thinking about what we were going to do after we launched it. Um, that's kind of how it works. We like launch something, we maybe get some press. Um, sometimes, like with the brand, there's some brands that are going to be interested in more in press and some in more in reach. This is like okay, well, maybe we'll get a little bit of press because we're using target tracking for the first time, um, but you know maybe we won't get reach because. Who's going to show up to all of it? Right, right, right. So it's just one of those moments that yeah. you kind of get lucky in some ways in that use case. So how has that, uh, you know, impacted your business? You know, you you, got, you have something that went super viral, and you know, how's it impacted? Are you getting like 
requests left, right, and center? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we had been getting a bunch of requests. I think, like, you know, something like with a, a brand like Nike, they have so many different business units that um, when, you know, you do something like that, you have probably, we, I think I had six business units call me the next day um, from just within Nike. Um, and obviously, you have other, other brands that are reaching out that are talking about it, too, as well. But, yeah, it definitely helps. So, you know, we, we went from, and that was Snapchat. You talked about the reach on AR. Um, you know, Jason, you guys have done a lot of stuff in AR and different platforms. What are you seeing is getting the best reach out there? Because I, I know we'll talk about, you know, what you guys did with the NHL, but let's talk about, you know, what, what things are getting the most reach right now? What yeah, I think, I think in terms of reach, I mean, Snap is definitely a, a strong player. I mean, it's, it's not only because of their, uh, they have less users than, let's say, Facebook or, you know, I believe they have less than Instagram, but they have a uh, behavior that's built in. So uh, if, you're, if you're launching on Facebook, you might be able to reach a, a larger audience, but they may not be using the AR effects on a, on a daily basis. So it really depends on who you're targeting uh, and then picking the right platform for that target. And I think that the other big promise is web AR, right? So if you are a brand that has an engine that can, that can push a URL out there and drive traffic, then web AR is like the least friction version of that, you know, so. So I, I shout out to Eighth Wall. They've been doing these uh, tours around there, but uh, I think they're, they're really solving a big problem for everybody because, you know, I, I'm sure you guys all know as well, and we get calls all the time. We want to make an AR thing, but we don't want the app every time. So it's like, great. And we want it to do all the functionality. <laughs> so Mo, you're, you're working more in the VR side of things. So you guys have seen some phenomenal results. You know, you did a, a small trial of 10 stores. Two stores. Two, two stores. And then you scaled it to 100 <coughs> 100 plus, yep. So that's not normal. No, it is not. That's not normal <laughs> for, a, for a big company like Macy's to be like, okay, this technology is ready, let's go. So can you walk us through, you know, the first two stores and what the results were and then, you know, right now what you guys are seeing now? Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the, the baseline was that th this is a very new experience. We didn't even, our procurement team had no idea how to procure VR headsets. You know, that was the kind of challenges we're dealing with because it's a very, you know, foreign technology to especially our ecosystem. Um, for specifically, what we were, what my team was trying to really look at was two very core things. We, we weren't even very worried about you know, the, the sales element of it, we were worried about adoption and on two fronts, consumer adoption, but more importantly, employee adoption. And that's the, if you think about, especially our furniture business, um, you know, so we have furniture in about 300 stores. The average tenure of that colleague is, is north of 10 years. So the normal turnover that you're, you're accustomed with retail doesn't happen in furniture. Uh, so you had a colleague that had, you know, their tried and tested ways of, uh, selling furniture, and now we were trying to embed, you know, uh, an emerging technology. Um, so we were really focused on figuring out how to drive that adoption. You know, we had a comprehensive, um, a comprehensive training plan, uh, but also because it's a high, it's a commission-driven, you know, environment. Uh, making sure that providing them guidance on how does this help you convert better and and with higher basket sizes. But we were not even as much as we were tracking you know, different KPIs around sales and basket sizes and returns, our ultimate goal was were we able to drive adoption and was at least 75% of the colleagues in the store using it to drive whether sale or engage the customer. So what and, was the results then? And, and so that's where we were uh, significantly uh, you know, surprised in, in, in terms of it. So we, we saw employee adoption in the first two stores at about you know, 85, 90%. Um, and then we, as we started looking at sales, uh, we were seeing about double digit of our sales coming through VR, but those transactions were about 60% higher. So anytime VR was involved in a furniture transaction, the basket size was 60% higher. Hold on, can you repeat that? For the, for the people who are making notes. Yeah, so any, anytime a transaction went through VR, the basket size was 60% higher. In, the, in, in these two stores. Uh, as we gave enough lead time, we started seeing returns drop by about 25 to 30%. So if, and if, you're, if you know the furniture business, the returns, is relative, returns rate is relatively lower uh, compared to apparel, but the cost of managing that returns is dramatically higher, the bulk nature of the goods and stuff. So 
Uh, so on, on almost all fronts, uh, the adoption rate, the, the, the basket size, the returns rate, we were significantly surprised in how good uh, the results were. Uh, and so to your point, this is not typical from a large retailer to say, right, let's go in, in you know, a year or two ago, we would have said, let's go to you know, five more stores or 10 more stores. Uh, we had the right leadership to say, no, let's go big. There is en we've seen enough to know that there is something in this technology that really allows us to solve uh, a problem and there's a practical application to a, a business that's top priority for the company. Uh, so that led us to go from two to 100, and uh, we completed 110 in January this year, and we're on track for uh, you know a bunch more this year. So you now are in 110 stores. Now you saw 60, 65 or 60? 60. 60, yep. 60 percent increases in basket size. You, you've seen a 20 percent decrease in return rates. Is that carrying over to the stores? That, that is. So in, 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 in the 110, we're seeing about a 45 percent increase in the basket size. There's typically a uh, a lead time involved, and, and there, it takes a little bit of uh, time to, uh, to gain traction. The last 40 stores came in in, in January, but in the initial, um, the, the original 70 stores that we launched, that we completed last August, you're seeing above closer to 50% increase in basket size. So it's holding up, and the, the critical piece is the employee adoption is held. It's a little bit lower than where it was in the pilot, but it's still held. So that's also very critical because eventually the sales are going to come. You've got to just focus on the adaption element of it. As soon as you've solved for that, the sales, like our data tells us that the conversion uh, happens over time. It's just incredible. Like these numbers are astronomical. I, I mean, any retail location, you know, getting 5% boost in sales would be incredible, but 50% is, is unheard of. Now, you know, one of the things that, that also is an added benefit to this is that when you guys build new furniture stores, a full complete furniture store within Macy's, it's got to be you know half a million dollars, mm -hmm. a million dollars. What does it cost to put in the VR setup compared to? It doesn't cost half a million dollars. <laughs> it, it, it's significant. It's less than ten percent of that. Mm -hmm. the, and th that's the idea. So if we if you, if you look at the portfolio of uh, Macy's stores today, we're in about five hundred and eighty odd. Macy's branded stores across the country. Not all of them have furniture. And as you, as you move down the line to, we're in about 300 or so now, um, you start realizing that the ROI just isn't there to build a fully fledged uh, furniture store. So VR becomes a critical tool for us to figure out, can I build VR as that virtual furniture gallery that may be, that I could drive sales to Macy's.com, I could drive sales you know, through, through the existing uh, environment without the investment that I would need to make to build a fully fledged furniture gallery. So that's the path we're headed this year is to figure out how do we craft that experience that VR allows you to become that furniture. Uh, you leverage the technology to build a virtual uh, furniture gallery. Incredible. <clears throat> Let's move from retail to sports because Jason, I know you've done some really cool stuff and you, you did some work with the NHL and uh, you, you managed to figure out how to do something magic on the ice. So yeah. tell us about that. <laughs> well, uh, it was Hold def on, don't, it just let the suspense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was uh, definitely a big team uh, uh, effort. Uh, basically for um, in January at CES actually, it was the first time they, they did real telemetry in NHL. Um, so that's real speed and data and positional information from all the players and the puck on the ice. Um, this was done okay, by hold a company. How did you get the puck tracked? So it wasn't us. It was, it was this company called Jogmo from Germany. They actually have uh, positional chips in, in the puck itself, and every player uh, has a chip on, on their uh, uniform. And then they have 16 sensors around the rink. And that was all capturing at 2,000 updates per second. Uh, all this data was shoved up to an Intel server in the rink. And then the Intel server was uh, kind of simplifying that. Uh, data feed and then sending it out to five partners. And we were the AR partner in, in that mix. But it was, um, it's big for the NHL because one, they have sports betting uh, is, is legal now. Um, so the idea of like data plus sport uh, plus betting is a, is a big win for everybody. Um, and then also I think this idea of, you know, MLB baseball has had years and years and years of stats and it's so much part of the fan engagement, but with NHL, with hockey, that hasn't been the case. Um, and that affects things like, you know, um, uh, like your, your online games or, you know, uh, uh, so 
there, there's a lot that, that can be made out of, uh, of that data. But so it was a very interesting challenge for us because, um, again, this was like the first time in the world. So everything from nothing was tested. Like, what is the Wi-Fi connection? <laughs> like, how do you, like, what is the, the throughput speed from the ice? Um, you know, it's very different. I think on my last panel with the Red Sox, it's, it's very different when there's no one in the arena and when the arena is completely full. Um, so how do you guarantee that kind of bandwidth and stuff? And then oh, what? Gee. Yeah, exactly. It's coming. And then, <laughs> and then what is the what is the right consumer experience? Like how much? So what we did was we basically took all that data and you could uh, place an ice rink on your tabletop or on your floor, and you could see every single player in real time uh, moving with that's, the broadcast. Um, and that's you could ridiculous, by the way. Thanks. And you could tap on every single player and see all their instant like their real time stats. And it's tied to the play-by-play -play as well. So, so um, you had some unfortunate or, or, or unintended consequences of that, though. There were some people that didn't like that. Yeah. So the interesting th thing is that, like, uh, we were we were we created it as a consumer experience, and then we actually got approached by a lot of the teams because uh, they saw that as a management tool. So now you can actually track your players over time through a game. And apparently, like, n not only in, in hockey, but in other leagues as well with these real-time stats, the older players tend not to like that so much because you can actually see, like, the how their, yeah, their decline, like, empirically over time, <laughs> so, or in a game. But, I mean, that's kind of data that a coach would need. You know, if you can just look down at your phone and see the vitals of your, of your team, you can be like, hey, you, you're off next, and you can keep your team refreshed based on their real speed data. That's incredible. And I think for the consumer too, it's super interesting just because, you know, we, we in our prototype, it was kind of a, a constant feed. You could check the, the stats at any time, but maybe when this becomes a, a, a real consumer platform, it's something more of an AR replay. Like you see a, a big play on TV and then you get to see it in slow motion, broken down, all the speed stats and stuff. So It's going to be great when we can put on our glasses and see the hockey game on the table as well as watching mm -hmm. the TV. It's going to be awesome. So Richard, you work for a small startup. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Nestle's just kind of figuring their stuff out. Mm -hmm. But how do you start innovating in, in a company? Like, where do you even begin to start innovating in a company that big? Like, hey, we want to do AR. Like, you, you mentioned in our call earlier that, you know, you had some AR with Nespresso and stuff. So maybe explain that. And, but I think people want to know, where does a big company start with this, because you know you're a monster company, how does that how does it start? Well, for us, and <clears throat> we've been doing AR now for you know up to seven to eight years in different capacities, right? Uh, it's always something that we've looked at it from maybe a more promotional standpoint of saying, okay, the big summer promotion is coming up. Uh, how do we leverage AR to be part of that? So I think <clears throat> what we've kind of shifted in the past couple of years, especially with how this technology keeps advancing every three to six months, something's uh, happening. We're really doing a lot of testing in different areas and trying to put stuff right in front of consumers and then get some feedback from them you know, immediately of like, okay, is this providing value to you? Is this something you would use? Um, do we need to shift or pivot in a different way that will you know, provide some value back to the uh, consumer? So for Nespresso, for example, um, if we go back four years ago, we were doing more of an AR engagement that was uh, more app-based. And we're going back before AR Kit, AR Core, um, a lot of SLAM and VIO wasn't in place. So we we're literally Are you having- using Mateo? No, I don't think so at the time. <laughs> but even then it was like, um, you know, we were having a consumer download an app and print out, um, you know, an image to track and then, you know, having them scan that. And yeah, once they have that experience, that's actually, you know, it's something that's engaging. They can change the color, personalize it their way. but. You know, how many people are going to download that app first that's a Nestle branded app? We have our experience with apps, um, you know, going back 10 years, even not even in AR capacity. We've probably done hundreds of apps. We've probably had a 1% success rate on apps. And I always tell people internally, you know, we've done two apps really well. We've done the Nespresso app itself, which uses to manage orders and um, buy coffee, find boutiques, things like that. And then the other most successful app we've had is uh, an app from the Frisky's brand from Purina, which is called Catfishing 2, and it's an iPad game for your cat. So they're able to swipe the screen and everything like that. It's our most downloaded app, our uh, most top rated app. So no, I swear we know, I, I I swear we know what we're doing. But. I gotta give a shout out to, there's a blog called Cats and VR. Uh, it's a real thing, look it up. No. So, so that's the thing, it's, it's kind of like, apps are really hard. So 
we take that, we take, okay, Nestle branded apps are hard. Maybe AR as just the only value proposition is hard as well. Um, if we kind of pivot that thinking and, th and say, okay, our channel that we have consumers at is the Nespresso app. Uh, we have a lot of people going there. If we're using AR to add as a value uh, added as a feature to the overall value proposition of the Espresso app to say, you know, here's what the new machine looks like that's coming out this season. Uh, here's an, a feature to scan the capsules for a new brand to see the story of where that coffee is coming from, the sustainability story. Um, if you're able to use it for promotionals and incentives, uh, use as a companion app to guide them through an Espresso boutique, that's where you start to get a lot of tangible value added back um, to that AR experience. And it provides more utility, maybe it's, a less, it's less flashy or sexy, but it provides utility and real value back to the consumer. And that's kind of been our focus, is continuing to test and, and go back to like, what's that consumer problem we're trying to solve? And how can augmented reality provide a way to solve that? I've been hearing a lot from a lot of people that are, you know, been doing this for a few years that it really comes down to the utility of, mm -hmm. of what you're doing. And, you know, AR should be a part of something bigger. And, and you know, in Snapchat, it's a, it's a messaging app. And, you know, you've leveraged that to, to give, you know, a great branded experience. And, you know, Facebook, you know, has their face filters and stuff like that. But really what it comes down to is, is AR doesn't have to be the central focus of what you're doing. I think it really can, can be enhancing some other parts of an app or something. So in, in closing, I, I want to just have uh, each of you maybe give one piece of advice for, for companies looking to get, get into and get started with this. What would the first thing uh, be that you would give them advice? We'll start here. Yeah, I would just uh, say to consider what your um, built-in assets are already. Um, so kind of like what you were mentioning, um, I think uh, you know, we were kind of talked about this before, like Nestle, for example, they have an Espresso app, which is very successful. That's a built-in asset that you can integrate AR into already. Um, another thing we talked about is like Nestle prints out tons and tons of things. Um, if you have that much packaged goods out there, you can put markers on there. Um, so like we work with um, like Sony, for example, on a lot of their retail products. Yep. Um, that's like the, you walk into a Walmart and you see these huge um, Hotel Transylvania um, retail uh, packages and those, are, those things are already being printed. Mm -hmm. So when you provide, um, let's say a QR code or whatever it is, that's a free source of uh, organic advertising that you mm -hmm. otherwise would have to do an ad buy for. Yeah. So every company has different assets that are gonna lend itself to basically like free branded advertising content um, that uh, that's that's really going to like drive a lot of value for a marketing team. So I think I would just ask yourself as a brand, um, you know, what are my built-in assets, and then how can I integrate AR to get free, basically like free advertising. Yeah, amazing. I'd say just yeah, the one note on packaging is yeah, like you said, we have tons of packaging out there, and that's our biggest real estate, right? That's the most visible part of kind of our brands and our products. So having the opportunity to turn those, you know, more into a digital owned channel where we can leverage that, that message to consumers and it's quite, you know, more engaging than say a digital ad or something like that. Um, like I said, we've done a lot of AR stuff. We've done it um, sometimes not in the right way, not with best practices, like no call to actions on the packaging and everything like that. And even then, like what we see of a kind of like an interaction rate, like a crude, here's the amount of packages out there, here's the people that have scanned it even something like a 3% you know, return rate on that. And if you compare that to you know, what you would get from a click-through rate for a digital ad, and you start to add up the dollars in a company as big as ours, where we're talking about media budgets of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, that provides real transformative value you know, back of engaging with consumers. And that's kind of you know, where I think we look at that for that focus, is that's the big picture opportunity that can be really transformative. Awesome. Uh, for us, there's a couple of things. One is like to take a campaign approach. Again, there's there's so many different avenues for for AR. I wouldn't put my bet on just one. So uh, you can repurpose assets. So you can create something that's that that's on Snap, on Facebook, on Instagram, but then also a, a bigger version that's you know on on mobile, and then an even bigger version on on headset, uh, for example. But I think ultimately the big goal that both of you guys I think have achieved is like do something purposeful. You know, like ultimately. The thing that makes it sticky is if it's actually useful. Um, and so, yes, there's a lot of kind of fight right now to try to get like visibility and reach and stuff like that. But I think the long-term test of this technology is going to be 
will people use it and why do they use it and how does it actually help them on a day-to-day -day basis? So, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's critical, the, the problem-solving element of what you're actually trying to solve and you know, if there is a practical application, especially from an enterprise standpoint where uh, there is that tendency to find something cool and just you know, launch it, but if you're not laser-focused on what you're trying to solve actually, um, you know, that, there, there isn't longevity there. I think the, the most critical advice from an enterprise standpoint is find a champion, find a leadership champion. Uh, what I did me didn't mention in the two stores were our, t our team when we, when we launched uh, our first two pilots was a relatively new team, it was a couple of months old. We weren't funded, right? So there we wanted to do it in two stores, and, but we didn't have the funds to do it. But we found one champion that said, here's all allocated from my budget, go do it and let me know how it goes. That two stores ended up at 110. So always find that leadership champion that believes in the idea, of, you know, pitch it uh, and what you're trying to solve. And once you've found that, you know, that, that, that goes a long way to, uh, you know, scaling something like this. There's some amazing advice. I literally have no idea how much time we have left because <laughs> this thing is, yeah. <laughs> has gone from one minute to 17, back to five. How are we doing? I've, oh, so that's real. Oh, yeah. All right, so we've got seven minutes. <laughs> So first of all, because they're making so much noise, everybody in this room on the count of three, we're gonna make as much noise as possible because we gotta show them up a bit. One, two, three, yeah! Woo! That was for you guys. So since we got seven more minutes and then we, we have some amazing experts up here, uh, let's talk about me. So let's talk about some of the other things. Jason, I know you've done some, uh, some other stuff other than the NHL, so let's maybe dive into some other uh, things that you guys have done, and we'll, we'll talk to Eden as well. Uh, yeah, sure. Like, uh, one, one of our favorites is actually for the Lego Museum in Denmark. Ah. It's, a, it's a fish designer. It's the highest performing uh, exhibit they have there. Uh, it's 30 to 40 minutes average playtime. But basically, what happens is the kids go up, there's six giant digital tanks, and you build your fish out of brick, Lego brick, and then you take it up to a scanner, takes like 10, 15 seconds, and then it actually digitizes the fish that you built out of brick, and it releases it into the tank. And then once it's released into the tank, it has all this AI and animations happen every minute and all that sort of stuff. But the, the, the thing I, we're really proud of is kind of like the elegance behind it. Um, and it didn't, it wasn't our first idea, so we actually, uh, we've worked with Lego for six and a half years now. We've done 30 plus digital physical play prototypes to try to fine tune what, find the fun, which is really actually quite difficult. Um, but what we discovered was uh, uh, simplicity, that um, we did prototypes where you could build the fish, put it in the tank, and then play games with the fish and control the fish and all this kind of stuff. And all the kids uh, just returned to keeping it simple, letting them do what they want to do, which is build and brick. And then, and then uh, augmenting that experience. So that's, that's kind of a, AR doesn't have to be the primary ingredient, or XR doesn't have to be the primary ingredient, but it, it can be a, a really great facilitator uh, and, and enhance the overall experience, so. Love it. And you know, Eden, you guys have done tons of work as well, so maybe talk about some of the other things you've done. Yeah, so we did something similar to uh, what Macy's is doing with uh, Walmart on the retail side. We did a, um, uh, so one of our, uh, one of the things that we were trying to figure out for VR was um, for a company like Walmart that's huge, um, what are the categories that would make sense for VR? So like um, for VR, you, you obviously have this experiential buying um, capability. Um, you know, obviously for furniture works, works really well. But for Walmart, we were thinking um, fishing would be uh, very interesting, not just because uh, we're called Fisherman Labs, but um, <laughs> there's uh, obviously like digital shopping. The, the, the uh, downside to digital is you can't actually play with the the, the things that you want to buy. But in-store, we wanted to say, how does VR elevate the in-store experience better than going out and actually trying um, the items themselves? And fishing is a category that's very confusing because you can go and uh, go to a fishing shop and you can try the rods, you can feel them, but it still doesn't tell you anything about um, what rod you should buy because that really depends on what fish you're trying to catch, um, where you're going to fish, and different things like that. Cool. So um, what we were able to do is build an experience that allowed people to select um, where they're fishing, like salt water, fresh water, what type of fish they're catching. We had a lot of educational components inside of that. And then we allowed people to actually try the rods. So we, um, we got f the physical rods of, um, we, got, we even got the boat, uh, and we went out on the shore. We, we tested the physics behind each of the rods so that it's, it's you know, perfectly accurate to how the rod interacts. Um, we, you know, put, 
um, uh, pucks, uh, vibe pucks on on the rods, so that you know people could could test them in store, but you know it actually feel like they're out and and, and, fi and fished. And, and tested conversion across that, and obviously can't share stats around that specifically, but um, that that was something that was very interesting to see, like how VR were was the results tell. positive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have you know big big companies experimenting, trying things, getting in there, getting their feet wet, but then seeing great results. So you know, Richard, you you guys have done a ton of stuff in AR. Mm. What about um, you know? What other marketing things have you done that have, you've seen success in? So, yeah, we've seen a lot of st uh, st going back to some of the uh, stuff Macy's is doing around uh, on st like on-site, on-store uh, locations. Whether we have um, like with Nespresso, we have boutiques, but with KitKat, we have these things called chocolatories. Uh, and chocolatories are literally you walk in um, and you're able to design your own KitKat there. Like pick what type of uh, toppings and flavors you want on it. You kind of leave, you come back in an hour, and you have a personalized Kit Kat. Um, one thing that we did that was pretty uh, cool and successful was um, we kind of tied that with VR, where we had um, you know HTC Vive station. You walked in, and within the VR game, you're actually designing the Kit Kat yourself. So you're taking up different uh, toppings and flavors. You're oh, spraying them on the Kit Kat. You're taking the different chocolates. You're spraying it as well. Um, they have that experience. Uh, they take the end input of what they did with that uh, Kit Kat, and then you come back, and exactly what you designed in VR, um, you know, was available for you there. So kind of like what's personalizing like, it. As what's well. the response of that? Like people must be, <laughs> because you're in VR, you design a chocolate bar, yeah. you come back in an hour, and there it is. Like yeah. you designed a dessert, and it's there. Like, <laughs> What are people's reactions? No, it's huge. It's massive. Uh, I mean, it, it got tons of impressions. Uh, that we saw uplift in the stores themselves. People going there. Um, most of those chocolatory stores were more temporary, so you know, went away after a while. But uh, it was a, a big impact. Um, uh, maybe on the other side. So can you make it available in Vive so I can order it? And, and we could, it in yeah, house we and could throw it on the <laughs> Steam store probably. You should make it on the Steam store. <laughs> or, or now Quest as well. Because well, I, I would say related to that, maybe something that wasn't as successful was we also did uh, KitKat branded as well. We did um, an app called Breakland, which was more of a mobile app uh, that ha was really good like VR content. It was like different, a couple different games. You have a, one was uh, called Breakbeat. You had these Kit Kats flying at you. You had to kind of dodge them like a you know, Guitar Hero and stuff like that. It was actually really good content. But what we found was, you know, try to put that in store and then advertising that, it just didn't really resonate with people, right? Or it wasn't the, maybe the right consumers, the right markets we were trying to do. And we tried to maybe use this as an asset that couldn't be, but maybe a little bit ahead of its time or not the right medium. Um, so it's really trying to find, uh, going back to what I was saying before, we, you know, what we look at is we need to test a lot of different things, and we're going to find some stuff that's going to be you know, impactful and successful, and then we're going to find some stuff that maybe doesn't work right away, but it allows us to improve our understanding and adjust for the next time. I think you know, what I've been hearing across the whole industry is that you know, the companies that are going to be successful at virtual augmented mixed reality or XR or whatever you want to call it, AR, VR, VR, whatever. I, I wrote an article, the ABCs of R, if you ever look it up. It's literally everything. But the companies that are experimenting, making mistakes, you know, learning what resonates, what doesn't resonate, because to be honest, we don't know. You didn't know two years ago that, that VR in the store would, would increase sales by 60%. You, you, know, you didn't know that a, a block breaker wouldn't work, but a candy developer did. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I think the key with it is to start experimenting right now, because this technology is really, I mean, we keep saying it's an, in, it's an infancy, but you know, this conference 10 years ago had like 300 people. It has 6,000 now. This is growing by leaps and bounds, and it goes. We're about to hit the exponential curve of all these technologies. VR, you know, VR, AR, IoT, 5G, quantum computing, blockchain. All of them together are starting to work together. So companies that are not experimenting with all of these different technologies, they're going to get left behind. And that it's going to be like Web 2.0, where people that oh, we don't need this website. What's that? What's e-commerce? Well, Amazon just kicked your ass right across the board. So. I think the, the take home message for everybody is that if you're a company, you need to find a champion, you need to start experimenting, you need to make mistakes because you're gonna make mistakes, but having that internal champion I think is, is key, finding that little bit of budget and then just doing it. You know, is there anything else that, that you guys wanna share? I think we're gonna have to stop. Are we done? Nope.
<laughs> All right, I have one more thing to announce. Now we're over. Tomorrow we're making a big announcement. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned. It's going to be hot. Thank you.